of course he he's into various committees and various uh, um, bodies such as american association of advancement of science and institute of uh, physics united kingdom he's an elected fellow of that uh, however let me come to his physics interests uh, doesn't need introduction but let me just briefly uh, tell what are his most important works i think um, uh, the most cited works are uh, kinematic approach to mixed state geometric phase in non unitary evolution then direct estimations of linear and non linear functionals of quantum state security of quantum key distributions with entangled q dates and so on and so forth and today he is going to tell us about quantum computing in the nisq uh, era which is about noisy intermediate scale quantum uh, uh, computing and let's hear more from him uh, we are already delayed by about half an hour so uh, professor quick uh, we are starting now uh, i will prompt you around 50 minutes into the talk uh, so that we have some time for discussion and questions. Is that all right? Thank you, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Poonam. Uh, I, I hope I pronounce it correctly. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, I should thank the organizer uh, for the invitation to this conference. Uh, I, I will try and keep it short knowing that it is already lunchtime now. And uh, uh, originally, uh, I did not realize that it's a quantum optics conference uh, or lecture series at school. And uh, I prepared this lecture slides on uh, recent developments in near a noisy intermediate scale quantum computing, uh, largely based on a recent paper that we published in the Review of Modern Physics. Uh, but uh, it is going to be um, a light talk in some sense. I'm not going to show you many equations. Uh, so sit back and enjoy and um, for the next hour or so. And um, uh, I, I, I realized that well, I'm eating right into your lunch time, but uh, perhaps you can have your lunch on a Zoom session on your own. Right. Uh, so, so let me continue with this uh, 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 talk. I would like to mention that a long time ago, in a very far off island, it's, it's not very far off, you know, near close by island from Greece, um, Antikythera Island, there was a discovery being made um, about, this is about 100 years ago. And what they salvaged was an instrument that um, was subsequently known to have a very sophisticated features. And they do analysis on it. And uh, I think uh, it is uh, probably an, uh, one of the first analog computer that, 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 that could be uh, uh, discovered. There's a movie, I will not play the full movie. I'm not even sure if you will hear it or if it, if it will come. Uh, oh, it has to come join with computer audio, okay. And I, I think I, uh, if it hadn't been discovered when it was in 1901, no one would possibly believe that it could exist because it's so sophisticated. This mechanism would be remarkable even if it was a less clever thing than it is. This is the story of one of the most extraordinary finds in history. This corroded bronze object is a machine that can look into the future. It was built 2,000 years ago in ancient Greece. Somebody somewhere in ancient Greece built an extraordinary machine that was actually a mechanical computer. A hundred years ago, a group of divers chanced upon a wreck full of the largest hoard of ancient Greek treasures ever found. Among the priceless ancient Greek bronze sculptures is another bronze object, no bigger than a modern laptop. It's known as the Antikythera mechanism. As a team of science. 
So, I'm, so, so I'm going to stop. I have to add me into the iPad because I can unmute myself. Focus on. I still have the iPad. Speak from yeah, I'll speak from the computer. My computer is generally very noisy, so that's why I hooked it on to the iPad. Anyway, you can find this uh, BBC movie on YouTube, and uh, uh, it's an hour long. And So, uh, the history of computer actually started with um, uh, an invention uh, due to Joseph Marie Jacquard, a French merchant and inventor, who designed what's called the uh, loom with punch card to automate the, the weaving of our fabric designs. Uh, in fact, this is the machine that uh, give us the early punch card that some of you well, have to be pretty old to, 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 to be using it. Um, and like even like, as long as say, 200 years ago, uh, an English mathematician, Charles Babbage, he conceived a steam-driven calculating machine. And this was a few thousand years uh, after Antikythera. But nevertheless, this is the first mechanical mode of uh, engine that we know of today. Unfortunately, this machine was never built. Uh, it was presented to the British government, got a funding, a pretty handsome funding, but nevertheless, uh, no prototype was made. And uh, in fact, uh, in, in today's term, the difference machine ends in uh, failure. This machine has been made, but it has been made um, by the British Museum, uh, uh, British Science and Technology Museum, uh, just next to Imperial College, uh, um, but uh, much, much later. And the person who designed it gave a talk on the internet, and you can actually hunt for that. And of course, uh, Charles Babbage said that he was sitting in the rooms in an analytical society in Cambridge, and he was dreaming about uh, a, a, a sort of a machine that can uh, enable him to do the calculation of the table of logarithms. Uh, but uh, uh, that, that led to his difference machine. There's also the analytical machine that he subsequently uh, uh, designed not built. And the analytical machine is well known uh, years later for having uh, the basic designs of a current computer because it features many features of the modern computer. The input devices based on punch card, a control unit, a storage, and an output mechanism. It has a separation of the memory from the central processor is a, now a fundamental feature of most of our current computers. And the programming language, equivalent to the assembly language, uh, with, uh, uh, was Turing complete and with loops and conditioning branching. 
Now, the first um, computer in that sense that was built subsequently uh, using vacuum tubes was sometimes this, this is a little bit disputable, but uh, has been attributed to the ABC computer, well, the Atanasov dairy computer. So Atanasov uh, uh, built this computer with the student. Uh, it comprises of 270 vacuum tubes, but essentially this machine which looks like a, a sewing machine, uh, was specifically used for solving linear equations. The ANIA, which is uh, by far now uh, the first, probably the first programmable calculating machine was built with over 18,000 vacuum tubes. Um, it weighs 30 tons and it consumes a huge amount of power. Uh, in fact, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it shut down the power supply for Princeton at, at the time when it was set up. Uh, so let's go back to the 19th century industrial revolution. Now at that time, uh, we see that the revolution led in some sense uh, Charles Babbage to, to think about the need for accurate tables, trigger table types, interest rate, and this uh, spawned, in some sense, the need for uh, calculating machine. But as we know from uh, Charles Babbage's effort, uh, it wasn't a success. And um, we look forward to, to other indicators. The exploding population in the United States in the 1880s uh, necessitates the need for statistics, the comp compilation, the census taking, and most of this led to uh, a good the calculating machines in the 18th century, the Hollerick machine. And uh, it was able to solve uh, some of the problems. And then the uh, census problem in particular. And then the question was, can they apply it to the increasingly complicating railroad problem? But it was, again, another failure. The First and world, Second World Wars, in some sense, fuel the need for uh, a ballistic calculation, uh, uh, calculations on the uh, how far the trajectory of uh, rounds can go. And this prompts, in some sense, uh, the, the building of calculating machines as some, somewhat known nowadays as the ANIAP machine. Uh, in fact, uh, the First and Second World Wars uh, is, is where uh, some of the budget, when, whenever you have a, a, a crisis, uh, such as a world war, uh, a lot of money can be funded uh, and channeled into building projects. And this, one of these projects was in fact any. And uh, calculating machines end up with uh, gets uh, smaller, uh, uh, leading to what's called a mini machine uh, and the uh, mainframe in the 1960s. Uh, so this was a, a need, this was all fueled by the need for firing tables and cracking codes. And uh, unfortunately also one of the most useless prediction was Eisenhower election and followed by the space race in the 60s. So basically uh, this brief summary tells us uh, what is our take on this matter. We have seen that we need crisis to build a computer in the past. So what is the crisis for the quantum computer? Uh, when is a truly quantum simulator and an analog computer going to be built? Uh, chicken and egg problem, when is quantum cryptography needed, ever needed? What would be the outcome? of the current industrial investment in quantum computer? What if all of these uh, attempts fail? Is there a good quantum material? So these are questions that we need to answer in the next couple of years, if not next decade. So Sesh Ahosh wrote something way back in 1996 before the current investment into quantum computer. Is quantum computer a dream or a nightmare? Well, it, it needs to be seen. His concern was decoherence. Uh, as a figure of merit, he used uh, 
the relaxation time against the operation time, which is typical. But the, uh, it turns out that uh, it wasn't very much um, very good. But nowadays, of course, you know, the super conducting qubit could, could beat that. Uh, but still, we have uh, a lot of challenges. A large-scale quantum computer is unrealistic. What about a small one with a few dozen qubits? So that sets the scenario for a paper in which uh, John Presque uh, wrote that the experimental state of the art and the demand for quantum error correction has encouraged the development of innovative algorithms. But uh, the near-term quantum computer are uh, noisy. So he, termed, he coined the word NISQ for noisy intermediate scale quantum computer. Intermediate scale refers to the size of computer, which is typically around 50, which is the current level, to perhaps a few hundred. 50 qubits is a significant milestone because uh, that's beyond what can be simulated by brute force for many uh, digital uh, supercomputers. Uh, like 50 very good qubits. But what we have now is noisy. And we have seen that uh, this advantage has been performed on the Google computer, as well as IBM computer, as well as the Chinese team. They have all shown some quantum computational advantage with uh, various platforms. So our, as, as we look at the see, landscape, we start off uh, in the early days with operation on single physical qubits. And you have heard uh, Franco's talk earlier on, wonderful talk. And that operates on very few qubits, three qubits, two qubits, one qubit. And this were the early uh, days when we look at quantum optics and see how we can uh, uh, manipulate uh, physical qubits to perform uh, logical states. Uh, logical operations. And then we went on to algorithms or multiple qubits. And then we start to do measurements and control uh, to test for error corrections. And of course, the ultimate step is fault tolerant quantum computer, which is uh, still out of the horizon uh, at the moment, at least. So, so we are, well, this whole idea on NIST quantum computing with increasing complexity is all about uh, the progress towards fault tolerant quantum computing. Now, in fact, uh, most of the current NIST quantum algorithms harness the power of uh, a quantum computer, but also uh, it harness the power of the classical computer. So in some sense, a hybrid system uh, and one of the most famous hybrid system is what's called the variational quantum computer, uh, which was proposed uh, a couple of years, uh, a, a couple of years, maybe 10 years by now, uh, um, by, uh, by a group at, at, in Bristol. Uh, and also, uh, Ma Hong was actually in China. So uh, this, this computer, essentially uh, finds uh, uh, what it does is that it, it has, uh, it prepares some state. Uh, it ultimately tries to uh, uh, compute the energy of the ground state, which is, let's say the ground state is X. It tries to compute X, the inner product of the Hamiltonian with, uh, with X in some sense, the average value of the uh, Hamiltonian in the ground state. But the ground state, of course, is not known. So you have to guess the ground state. And then you look at the output from the uh, quantum computer. And by adjusting the uh, cost function, you, 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 you look at the output, you put that into a classical computer, which, is, uh, which computes the cost function. And that cost function allows you to go back to the input and readjust the uh, uh, input values. And uh, at some stage, you find that it converges rapidly uh, to the uh, value that you want, and in particular to the ground state energy. 
Uh, so this was proposed um, quite some time ago, but uh, uh, it, it turns out that it's very convenient for the current noisy computer, because uh, even with noise, you find that you could perform pretty well on such computers. And that of course led to another NIST, possible NIST algorithm, which is uh, sometimes called QAOA, uh, quantum approximate optimization, uh, optimization algorithm. Essentially, the idea is that uh, you, um, you map the whole thing into an Ising uh, model. Uh, your cost function is based on the Ising model uh, over here. And um, if the two spins are in exactly the same direction, then uh, the cost function is actually zero. Uh, otherwise, it's one. So uh, you can use a, a series of iterative uh, unit tree case uh, uh, that uh, will bring the initial state to the uh, final state. Uh, and of course, along the way, uh, we have what's called a coherent Ising machine. Uh, this is really not really a quantum machine, but it's a classical machine. But it works um, pretty well, um, uh, although it is, uh, albeit a little bit tedious way of uh, manipulating uh, uh, the, the uh, logic. And there is, of course, quantum annealing program. Uh, that's another class of uh, possible needs uh, algorithm. And uh, it has been shown. Uh, or the D wave at the beginning, but uh, it is more than that. It can be used for proper quantum computing, except that uh, 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 there are also challenges regarding how to arrive. Well, certification sometimes is a bit complicated. Uh, the NIST and uh, the quantum algorithm, uh, uh, annealing algorithm, also make use of. Uh, uh, a subject matter that is close to my, to my heart, which is uh, semi-definite uh, uh, programming, SDP. And um, it is, uh, it in fact, is a, a form of uh, SDP. And uh, I was told that this might be something that is more interesting. Uh, the next uh, uh, possible algorithms on the photonic platform that could uh, could exhibit some quantum advantages is what's called Gaussian boson sampling. And what it does is that it, oh, all the formulas are gone. Yeah, there's a formula here. Uh, I could write here on the screen. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah uh, so so the the idea is that um, the equations are missing uh, so what I have in the input is uh, imagine you have a1 dagger a2 dagger a3 dagger in uh, acting on the vacuum. So uh, there, there are eight ports in this, uh, in this uh, unitary uh, machine. And uh, you expect to find, um, you would like to calculate what's the probability of the uh, photons appearing on the third, the fifth, and the sixth uh, output port. And so the equations here just um, uh, uh, that has disappeared on this slide is essentially I will have A1 dagger, A2 dagger, A3 dagger acting on the vacuum. And A1, of course, going through this unitary uh, gate will then become U11, B1 plus U12, B2 plus, and so forth until uh, U18, say A port, uh, U, uh, B8 dagger. And then the same thing with uh, A2. A2 is then written as uh, uh, a string of this uh, superposition, uh, U21, uh, B21, 
E1 plus U2 to E2 and so forth. And then finally you have A3 being converted into U31 and so forth. And you do the expansion. And then you pick up the terms that are uh, according to the output B1, B3 dagger, uh, B5 dagger, and B6 dagger. And when you pick up the terms, uh, you'll find that it's not hard to show that the coefficients, the U11 or all, all, all the U's in this uh, B, B, B3, B5, B6 uh, are, um, uh, form what is called the permanence of the matrix U. Uh, the submatrix U that defines uh, 1, 2, 3 and uh, 3, 5, 6. So the intersections of this. So uh, this is essentially boson septic. But of course it is done uh, uh, with uh, a lot of post-selection uh, because you have three photons coming in. The three photons can actually, two of them goes up to port three. One goes up to port five and nothing in port six. So you can have that. And what you do is that you discard those events. So the, the fact that you discard those events means that as the size of the matrix increases, uh, you are going to get a, a, a smaller and smaller probability of it uh, being successful. So uh, this has been extended, of course, to uh, Gau uh, Gaussian state. And with Gaussian state, uh, we don't call it the uh, permanence, but it's a half near, but nevertheless, uh, it's related to the uh, it's related to the uh, permanence. So whereas a determinant is very easy to compute for matrix, and we know that for from uh, classical calculation, permanence it turns out is very difficult, and that is the observation made by Scott Aronson a long time ago. But nevertheless, um, this has been done recently in a paper that's published a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, where the Xenadu team uh, showed on uh, 216 uh, input output port that there is uh, there's seemingly uh, some advantage in a programmable photonic processing. So this is the device uh, is uh, built in some sense three, three dimensional. We have also done similar work on Gaussian boson sampling in Singapore, uh, but on a specific graph, and we uh, use this uh, particular chip uh, to, to execute the uh, performance. And we have found that it, it shows very good uh, uh, but our, our, our graph is uh, certainly not as big as, uh, as the one that's like the objectives are quite different in some sense. So we, we think that we could apply it to various uh, applications. There is another subject that is also in, within the NIST uh, regime, and that is what is sometimes called the analog uh, quantum simulation. And one of the first experiments to perform that, uh, probably not the first, but one of the first, was uh, by uh, Emmanuel Bloch and Tech Hench and, uh, in 2002, where they showed uh, the transition from mod insulator all the way to, uh, to uh, superfluid. Uh, you can tell the differences when you load atoms into optical lattice, two-dimensional optical lattice, and looking at the uh, time of flight experiment, the interference pattern, you can see that uh, uh, whether it's super quick or not. Uh, in, along the same vein, we have uh, considered other uh, systems where we load uh, atoms into hollow fiber and in atoms with hollow fiber or acting on a four level system. So this is a, the atoms are all four level system, but they are talking to each other uh, to one of the, one sets of the energy levels. Uh, you could actually uh, map it to a polaritonic. Uh, so polaritons are uh, essentially uh, uh, 
Franco has talked about, Professor Nori has talked about uh, earlier on about the uh, James Gummy model. Uh, the uh, polaritons are really res uh, the result of uh, looking at a simple James Gummy model where you can show that uh, a photon interacting with a two level, uh, with a multi level atoms actually in most cases. Uh, uh, will shift the energy levels and and form a state that is uh, uh, n photons. If you have n photons coming in, then it's n photons and the atom is excited or the atom is in ground with n plus one photons. Uh, so there's a superposition of this. And by mapping it to the polaritons, we could show that this uh, is uh, can be mapped also to what's called the Lattinger liquid in one dimension. In one dimension, there's not a lot of difference between bosons and fermions. So uh, uh, the, the, the system here is essentially a, a, a Lattinger liquid, and therefore one can show speed charge separation. Also, we could mimic uh, the sine Gordon model. Uh, so this is a uh, we are slightly uh, uh, differences. So digital analog quantum simulations are also at this age, at this stage, uh, where part of the computation is, is done with a quantum computer, and part of the computer uh, computation is done with a classical computer. Uh, so these are uh, classified to some sense. As this computer. But what are the theoretical challenges? Well, one of the most uh, important uh, problems uh, that that people who deal with this quantum computer has to deal to have to deal with is uh, what's called the barren lateral landscape. And what is typically uh, uh, barren plateaus arises because when you look at the cost function, there are regions where the gradients are pretty flat. And because the gradients are pretty, pretty flat, uh, you cannot find the minimum value very easily. So uh, in fact, as the dimension of the Hilbert space increase, uh, the chances of uh, encountering a barren plateau, a plateau is increased. So barren plateaus are in some way roadblocks to, to a lot of things, and in particular, to trainability. Uh, and to, to, to study that one actually invent uh, new ideas, and two of the new ideas is what's called expressibility of the answer. So you look at the input answers in, and the output answers and, and, and the output, and then you look at how expressible the, uh, the, the input answers uh, how, uh, uh, is. Uh, based on the fact that if you look at uh, over uh, distribution of uh, random unit trees. Uh, so that's one direction. And in particular, uh, by looking at various uh, platform, including uh, hardware efficient uh, or, or brick layer uh, algorithms or gates, uh, one could compute expressibilities of areas and give us some insight into uh, what is possible and what is not possible on the needs on the computer. There is also the uh, problem of what's called reachability, uh, uh, which is uh, how uh, a given set of parameters, uh, uh, the, the parametric quantum is capable of representing a quantum state that minimizes an objective function. So that's uh, defined as the minimum between uh, the ideal state and uh, what is achieved on, on the quantum computer. And these two most uh, prominent roadblocks towards uh, scalable universal quantum computers, uh, for example, sensitivity to error, sensitivity to noise, in some sense, prompt us to look at a very important issue that is not quantum error correction, but rather quantum error mitigation. How can we mitigate the amount of noise? And one of the uh, uh, ideas is 
to, we know that there are a lot of uh, uh, ways of doing it, but one of the ways is to think in terms of uh, an N exponentiation of the identity matrix. So in short, you are not uh, changing too much the, uh, the uh, unitary matrices. And uh, there are various schemes that allow us to do zero noise extrapolation. So what you do is if you do add a certain amount of noise, then you do add a little bit less, and then you try to extrapolate to zero noise. So quantum error mitigation uh, has also uh, taken on a few forms. There's also what's called probabilistic error cancellation, which is uh, very popular with people who are dealing with uh, open systems, uh, uh, simulation of open systems with limpack operators uh, in the uh, quantum computer. Um, and typically what you do in this case is that you try to cancel uh, the errors. Uh, uh, you, you know that you introduce error, but you introduce extra gates that will cancel out the errors. There's also uh, other uh, mathematical means, but maybe I'll, for, for the sake of time, I'll skip this. And also uh, uh, definitions of uh, a set of Clifford gates that will, will do the job. There is, um, there is a technique called ZX calculus that's uh, been invented by the Oxford group, but, uh, uh, and it proved to be pretty useful for, uh, for looking at circuit decomposition and what would be the best way to uh, allow you to decompose a gate. So what are the various of, uh, uh, of applications that, that are possible at this stage? Um, many people have started to look at uh, whether the quantum computer can apply uh, to many body physics. At the moment, of course, we know that it is not so easy. Uh, most of the time it's done with few qubits, few bosons, few fermions. For fermions, you have to map them to, well, uh, you have to map them to, to bosons actually. Um, and, and, and even for bosons, there are a few uh, uh, way of encoding your system. You can do binary, which is the normal qubit, zeros and one. But you can also do unary, where every line in your circuits represents a single photon. So you do not uh, allow uh, two photons to get into your uh, the chip at any time. So I'm talking about photonic chip. Uh, and that, that has the advantage that if you only allow single photons at each step, then uh, you actually uh, eliminate uh, the need for post-selection. Because for linear optics, one of the main uh, uh, current uh, obstacle towards computing is actually uh, the fact that because it's linear, uh, it, is, uh, it hardly interacts uh, with uh, with itself, I mean, photons and photons hardly interact with each other. And so to form entanglement is actually rather difficult. Uh, I know that you have, uh, you have uh, uh, heard the lecture before, which talks about entanglement of many qubits, but that typically comes about with atoms. So non-linearity non is needed. And one of the non-linearity that you can uh, perform is through uh, a photon interacting with atoms. <coughs> but photons alone do not interact well. So, so what can you do? But it can be shown that if you only have a single photon, single one photon coming in, then you can build deterministic unitary gates. Uh, and, and this was found a long time ago by Salinger and rack, so it's sometimes called the rack scheme. Uh, uh, but it only allow us to perform one photon at any time for deterministic calculation. 
so that this is what the unary uh, or unary uh, uh, scheme is all about. It sort of uh, tries to uh, get around the problem of uh, uh, linearity in linear optic setup, but at a cost. The cost is that you increase substantially your given space uh, when you do representation. There are a number of other variational quantum eigen solver that has been proposed. Uh, I'll leave you to read in the literature. Also, there is some uh, application in terms of machine learning and combinatorial optimization, uh, yeah. and also for uh, foundation in terms of tests of violations of realism and contextual. Now, recently, with this unary uh, encoding system, we have uh, tried to apply it to study what's called option trading. Now, in option trading, uh, typically, you have a, 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 a Professor Quinn, a, can I interrupt? Yes. Uh, there is a question in the chat box. What are unary uh, bosons? So sorry? What are unary bosons? There is a question okay. in the chat box. What are unary bosons? bosons. No, uh, unary bosons are photons, okay, in my contact. Uh, I hope that. So unary photons are, well, photons are encoded in unary basis, are uh, essentially uh, uh, photons that goes into a circuit and only one, at any time, only one photon uh, is allowed to get it. So you imagine you have a, an end port input, end port output device. But at any time you demand that only one photon is input into any of the inputs. And then you look at the output port. Is the output port where the photon emerge if it's not lost? And typically for a short distance, it's, it's pretty, uh, the, loss, the loss is very minimal. Then you'll find that uh, it describes a unitary process, a perfect unitary process. And that's the right design. So I hope I answered that question. So the price uh, distribution, you start off with uh, an option at a particular price. And of course, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this commodity will change price along with time. And we mimic that with a series of uh, gates that allows it either to move up or down. So you can imagine it's somewhat like a, a, a random walk. You, you fix it at a particular time, and then you allow the photon to move up or down, and then it continues to do a selection. And in some sense, it's like a Monte Carlo, if you like, uh, simulation. Uh, and depending on the price at the end, you predict whether you get a good pair off or not. So that you do a pair off calculation. And in the process, of course, you use uh, amplitude and so we have recently done an experiment uh, on this. We use this chip. This is completely photonic. Uh, we input the uh, photon. This this is uh, this photonic chip is actually uh, in principle a demonstration. Uh, uh, and uh, we actually only use uh, very few uh, photons uh, with uh, a few ancillas. And what we have shown is that, uh, so this is the size of the chip, it's roughly three millimeter by 10 millimeter. It can be scaled down further, uh, but for experimental demonstration, we are not. Uh, so what you have is the encoding here. Uh, not sure if you can see it, but uh, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, um, actually, uh, this is binary uh, bits, I think. Yeah, so essentially the encoding, uh, yeah, so this is 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. But essentially, uh, 0, 0 rep is represented by a photon along this path. 0, 1 is represented by a photon along this path. 1, 0 is represented, so this is what is called unary. 
and, 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 and so forth. And the idea here is that uh, we allow this to go to uh, uh, a random walk, by random walk with, with photons. In other words, you have, I, I see a question, random walk with photons and and which means that uh, there is interference uh, uh, within the system. And so it's not exactly predicting probabilities. Uh, it's not a probability machine, right? Rather, it is uh, based on probability amplitude. So we allow it to go through and then we compute the cost function. So let me try and see what was the question. In options trading, you consider as, what do you consider as vertices? What, what do you consider as vertices and edges of the network? Uh, okay. Um, so the vertices and edges are, so there is only an input. So it's more like a tree uh, in that sense. Uh, you, you look at the previous slide. You look at the tree. You, um, it's, it's more like a, a, a tree sort of a, a graph where you, this is the first vertex, the input vertex. This is the input vertex. And then it chooses to go left or right. And then at the left or right, it chooses to go up or down again. Here it chooses to go up and down again. And, and it, it propagates forward. And as it propagates forward, uh, uh, the, those are your edges and vertices. I hope that that is somewhat clear. It's a tree in some sense, uh, not really a graph. And we badly need foundries of, okay, okay, yeah. So the, uh, that's true. You, uh, you, you need foundries to build such devices. But nevertheless, uh, once you get the foundry going, uh, a lot of things can be done. And the, the, the thing is that we have, uh, we have used one more step, which is uh, amplitude amplification, uh, uh, which is uh, essentially a quantum part. But the device as a whole is still classical. It's classical optics with interference. So it's fast in terms of the fact that optics, in optics, the photons travel very fast, well, at the speed of light. And uh, it also consumes a lot less energy, perhaps if it is scale up. But the results of the experiment and the uh, 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 simulation uh, perfectly match. You can see from, so one, 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 one column is the simulation, the other column is the experimental measurement. And uh, we, we, uh, we already have this result. Uh, also, with uh, uh, the, the a group at, at the Nanyang Technological Universities, we have used, uh, so these are the chips typically uh, that I was uh, referring to, uh, may not be quite the same as this one because it has different purpose. So you put in the input uh, uh, photons and then it goes through a series of, this is a beam splitter when the two uh, waveguides come together uh, simply because uh, they exchange uh, photons evanescently. And then you, it goes through another bean splitter. So this is another bean splitter. And uh, there's a phase shifter in between. So the two thing, the whole thing is a max zander interferometer, another max zander and so forth. <coughs> so typically you build many, many of this max zander on a tiny little chip. And we have shown that with this technology, you can actually uh, mimic a neural network, which means that you can actually use this integrated photonic chips uh, as a basis for uh, artificial intelligence. If it's scale up properly, it may even uh, uh, consume less energy than the current computer for training current computers for neural network. And of course, once it's trained, it's typically very useful. So this is, uh, and we have used it for uh, various uh, things. Uh, one is recognition of images. Uh, typically, the uh, uh, application and use uh, uses of uh, uh, 
uh, that is uh, practicing in many of the artificial intelligence networks. And we have also shown that it can also perform regression analysis for computational chemistry. So what is our take on the matter? Um, 2000 years ago in ancient Sumeria, we had the abacus. Well, 4,000 years ago in ancient Sumeria, we have the abacus. And then in ancient Greece, we have already a calculating machine. Uh, the Antikythera was around 1000 AD perhaps, or around the age of Alexandria. I, mean, I think it's, it's more like a thousand years later. But nevertheless, in, in Europe, the, the start of calculating machines starts way back in uh, with uh, Pascal, uh, who, who actually built a, a calculating machine to help his uh, actual life things as well, uh, to help with his work. So Leibniz built one for his father. Uh, and then there were others, uh, Grille, uh, Polanyi, Tito, they, they all come up with beautiful calculating machines. In 1745, out of practical need to do uh, fabric design, uh, Jacques came with his loom. And this loom turns out to be very useful for the hollering punching card machine which exists until the early 70s. Uh, in early 70s, the mini frame, uh, main, uh, main frame, uh, makes use of a lot of these punch cards. And uh, older generation of us can remember that if you lose one card in the middle, it's going to be uh, very hard to trace back the algorithm. Essentially, you, you waste a lot of time. Uh, then the Babbage machine was designed. Uh, and conceived around this stage. And then uh, it was followed by the uh, punch card. And around the same time, we have the Morse code and the telegraph being invented on the communication side. By 1936, uh, there were very brilliant scientists like Alan Turing. Uh, sorry, do you perform a continuous time quantum walk? Uh, Colin, hi, Colin, <laughs> uh, on a decision tree. No, actually, you can think of it as a continuous time uh, quantum walk, but actually it is discretized. Um, we think of each of the uh, uh, bean splitter as a time step, if you like. But you can, yes, you sure, you can think of it as continuous time. Sometimes you not differentiate between the two. So it's, uh, it is, uh, uh, in some sense, we are thinking of it as a discrete time random walk uh, or quantum walk, actually, uh, on, on the NIST uh, photonic chip. I hope that answered the question, Colin. Um, so the, in 39, uh, Atanasov, uh, uh, John Atanasov attempts to build the first computer. And uh, that was the, uh, uh, around the same time as the ENIAC. And in fact, uh, they both go into uh, the, high, uh, the US High Court. And actually, Atanasov won the, 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 the court case, uh, which put him as the inventor of the modern computer. But actually, his computer was not a programmable computer. In some sense, it reminds me of the quantum li li life the line at the moment, uh, where a lot of the machines are not programmable uh, computer as well. Um, in 1946, of course, you see the uh, you see the uh, uh, the growth of the uh, big computers uh, that occupies a lot of uh, a lot of space and also eats up a lot of money. And these were actually a big computer because uh, of the the need for vacuum tubes, which spoils very easily, but also were very bulky. Um, by the, 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 the cutting edge improvement, let us remind ourselves, came with the invention of the transistor, which at the time when it was invented was no larger, than, was slightly larger than a uh, uh, safety pin in that sense. And this 
led in fact to the build of small scale experimental machine. And so a lot of this work was done. And by 1950s, uh, people started to invent the integrated circuit. So that was done by Jack Kilby, Robert Noyce. Uh, in terms of languages, new languages were invented. Uh, the Fortran was invented in the 60s. Uh, IBM also announced uh, these storage devices. And then finally, uh, we have our modern computer. So, so where does the quantum computer start? In? Kicks in. Well, way back in 1980s, David Deutsch formulated what's called the quantum Turing machine. This is roughly 50 years after Alan Turing. Alan Turing designed this in the 1930s and 1980, David Deutsch put on this thesis. Around the same time, uh, or slightly earlier, Richard Feynman urged the world to build a quantum computer, simply because if you want to simulate the real world, the nature as it is, then you certainly need a quantum computer, a quantum machine. That was followed by uh, a series of uh, algorithms, uh, in particular, uh, Peter Shaw and uh, Lou Grover, who showed that uh, if you have a quantum computer, then uh, you could do calculation a lot faster. At the communication level, you have the invention of uh, new protocols that even if you have a quantum computer, you will still not jeopardize the, uh, uh, the security of uh, a current computing system. Because what Shaw showed was that you can factorize too large uh, num uh, a very large number into its uh, respective primes uh, very much, uh, much quicker than a classical computer. So if a classical computer takes three years, uh, actually the quantum computer will take several minutes. And this was a re real danger because a lot of our current security system is based on the non-factorization of numbers. And what these people showed was that even if a quantum computer exists, you can still use quantum, uh, quantum uh, key distribution. <coughs> and then it was way back in 1998, roughly 20 odd years ago, when the first two qubit computer was shown and that was shown on a nuclear magnetic resonance device. And it was rapidly uh, followed up with ion traps and D waves. And by, uh, by uh, the start of the COVID, uh, we have already seen that uh, uh, IBM could build something like a few hundred uh, qubits. Uh, so does Google and so does the Chinese. And there is now a race going on to see who can actually, uh, thank you. Um, who can actually do better in some sense. And of course, COVID happens. And when COVID happens, uh, can, uh, a lot of research in this direction has not lapsed. And that's somewhat good. And uh, uh, we are still seeing a lot of progress in, in the last year. And uh, also the recent paper by uh, Zanadu uh, with uh, 216 uh, photons. No, 216 input uh, uh, Gaussian boson set. Okay, so let me conclude with uh, that uh, much of the uh, information can be uh, gleaned from this uh, recent paper. Not so recent now, but uh, thank you very much. I, I hope I've written the correct thing. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for, for this very nice talk, uh, covering the details about what's going on uh, currently in quantum computation and how, uh, uh, how uh, things are difficult in some context or the other and how photonics is helping uh, in, in moving ahead in this direction. Now it's time to have some questions. 
participants either you can type your questions in the chat box or raise your hands i don't see any raised hand at the moment there was something in the chat box uh, okay it's just a comment by deborishi ganguly we badly need foundries companies in india to found, to build our own chips we are falling behind in the world of computing hardware yeah that's probably true i don't see any more questions in the chat box Oh, there are a couple of questions now for and during answer. the talk yes yes, yes. so uh, i would i would think that uh, uh, there are no other questions um, we can safely end here but uh, because it's already lunch time for you guys yeah we have another talk to go but uh, yeah generally <laughs> lunch time for us is little late it's not 11:30 or 12 we ah, generally see, eat see, at 2 so it's not so so much uh, we'll uh, be delayed by half see. an hour or so yeah, uh, yeah. i also has have uh, also the chance to meet many good friends yeah that's right yeah yeah it would have been nicer if you were here uh, in person Right, right. Professor Panigai. We would like to, Puna. We would like to thank uh, Professor Quek and Professor Nori on our behalf. Yes, yeah. yes, sure, thank you, sure. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. And we apologize for the delay. Uh, oh, it's okay. It's uh, okay. I think I, these things do happen. My next meeting is at four, so okay. that's still so about forty-five. Okay. It was, it was great that you could uh, and, and give us yes. your time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so so next